Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Adobe Live. Um, I am your host, Corey Hall. I am a graphic designer based here in Portland, Oregon. Um, and I'm joined here today by a very talented artist and illustrator, Rich Armstrong. Rich, do you want to say a quick hello? Hey, hi. <laughs> Is that um, quick enough? Yes, um, thank you. Um, <laughs> we'll do a quick introduction, but first I just want to say hi to some of the people in the chat. We've got people joining us from Behance. We've got Gareth in the chat. We've got Wade. We've got Annika. And um, if you're joining us from YouTube, make sure you um, make sure you subscribe to the Adobe Live YouTube channel. Um, let's see, we've got Kevin in the chat. We've got Ky Kyler, uh, Jerry. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, so let's get into it. Rich, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Do you want to walk us through who you are, um, your work as an illustrator, and maybe share some of your work? Yeah, for sure. So I'm in Amsterdam today or tonight. And it's really good to you know see you guys, hang out with you guys today. You know, some of you might be like super late in the night, really early in the morning. So yeah, thanks for joining me and Corey. Um, I'm an illustrator. I'm an artist. And last year, I was like, look, I really want to be authentic, and I want to make money using my imagination. Before that, I'd come in, uh, done a whole bunch of UI, UX, product design. I'd been teaching Skillshare courses and classes for I think seven or eight years. And I was just like, look, I want to you know, go back to being a kid version of myself. So I began drawing and doodling at the beginning of last year. I you know, just joined the NFT scene. I was like, what is going on here? I want to learn a bunch of stuff. And through that, I have produced a ton of art in the last year and a half. So I'm going to take you through some of that. This was my portfolio here on TapTap Tap Kaboom, which is a very fun name for me. A lot of people just know me as TapTap, Tap, which is kind of weird because Twitter, you know, truncates tap, tap, kaboom into just tap, tap. <laughs> and yeah, so this is my, my name here. So let me take you through some of my work, some of my portfolio. This, a mural. Guys, if you've never done a mural, I love it. I haven't done many, but this is like sweat, paint, dirt, sunburn, six hours in the sun painting, and it's big and people pass it. One of my favorite things wow. that I've done. This kind of stuff is all part of this thing that I call the doodleverse. These are happy sons. These are dream heads. These are bots with flaming heart warriors. Um, I have these like two quite distinct styles. Like this is like this doodly style. This is an abstract style, but I kind of see them both as doodling. One is far more abstract and intuitive. The other one is far more intentional, but they still, you know, both very doodly. So yeah, I'll just scroll through a couple of these things. And yeah, I've done a ton of collabs. I think I did maybe 30 to 50 collabs last year with different projects, different brands, different artists. Wow. Um, I've done generative collections, one of one collections, just tons of stuff on all kinds of different blockchains. And yeah, I absolutely love this kind of um, lifestyle, this kind of creativity. It just, it just awakens me. It makes me come alive. Done some... Yeah. Really nice collabs with uh, Mimi Chow. Um, this one at the top here was done with uh, Attitude Creative. And I think today that's kind of what I'd like to go into. I'm going to be exploring uh, AI and Firefly inside of Photoshop today. Maybe bring some of the, the work into Adobe Fresco and trying to just figure out how to do AI, but using my style because there's AI and I can almost spot AI from a mile away 95% of the time. Yep. I don't want my stuff to look like that. I want my stuff to look like my stuff. I want to learn how to use AI in my workflow. So I'm not quite sure how to like do something this doodle verse style, but maybe something like this, I could kind of, you know, swing it or work that into and with AI somehow. So yeah. I've been experimenting a little bit. Um, if you want to check out my Behance, I always used to call it Behance, but there's a couple <laughs> of projects here that uh, you can check out. And this is probably something that I'm going to be trying out today. Something a little bit like this, but maybe a little bit more doodle bomb e. If that's like a kind of expression. Um, and then you may also know me from my Skillshare classes. I've got about 40,000 students on Skillshare and I wrote a book. And wow. you may know of the thing called the 100-day project. So I'm not just an artist. I also teach people. I love helping people create and be productive and find their true selves, that kind of stuff. So if you want to go check out a book, it's really fun. 
It's called The Perfect 100 Day Project. And yeah, that is pretty much it. I also am a father of a two and a half year old kid. I have a wife, we live in Amsterdam. And yeah, just come back from holiday. So life is good. How's life that for Life sounds intro? great. Wow. Well, and can I just say your work is amazing. I mean, it's like so multifaceted and so layered and I like there's so much texture and color and movement in it. And we've got a couple people in the chat who are saying, love your work. Um, Pam Hilling says, love your style, dude. Um, I think someone called out something that I really focused on that you said, which is um, clever in the chat said the kid version of yourself. And I super connect to that. And I just think that that's really cool that that's sort of an idea that you've tapped into for yourself. And I I just want to say that that comes through in your work. It's it's like, I, I kind of love that as a concept. So just like really excited to see what we've come up with today. Yeah, awesome. Well, if you guys have any questions, I don't mind talking for ages, but I'm going to start, you know, drawing, doing some AI stuff in Photoshop. So if you haven't checked this out, check this out. I'm using Adobe Photoshop beta. And I think somewhere in the Adobe Cloud or the Adobe CC app, you can go and check it out. Um, I can't remember exactly where now, but this over here, this Photoshop beta over here is what I'm using. And with this, you can do some pretty cool stuff. So just as yes. an example, oh. I'm gonna go and select everything inside of my Photoshop document. And I'm gonna press this little generative fill here. And just as an example, I'm not gonna like you know, actually go through with this, but I can be like whale on a beach and press enter or return, press generate there. And man, I don't have to use stock photos anymore. I don't have to like sketch out a bunch of ideas. Photoshop just gives me a bunch of stuff, a bunch of options. And it's like, whoa, okay, that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Next, whoa, you know, that's pretty interesting. Next. You should be like, whoa, this is just crazy. And yeah. here you can be like, okay, let's just select this area here. And perhaps I can be like, uh, mermaid. And what it does, it doesn't just like collage stuff in there. Just take a random mermaid stock photo and put it in there. It kind of looks at your whole picture, your whole composition oh. and puts something in there. Sometimes it's not that good. Like that does not look like a mermaid to me, right? <laughs> Looks like someone in a wetsuit. Oh, wow. Like that's pretty interesting. That's oh also God. pretty interesting. So maybe it's like not so good at this. But what's cool is you can just like tap that. I'm like, okay, let's, let's do this again. So how about we go and kind of draw something here and we go for a ship. Exactly a ship. what I was going to say. <laughs> Not a mermaid, a ship. Let's be safe here. Um, if you don't understand anything I say, uh, I come from South Africa and we speak English. I speak English in South Africa. I speak English now that I'm living uh, in the Netherlands. But sometimes I say things and it, it doesn't translate into other English or international kind of cultures and societies. So that ship looks pretty good, right? Yeah, it does. That one even better. Like, so this kind of stuff is amazing. If you haven't played around with this, guys, like I would highly recommend playing with it just check it out it's super fun and i i bet there's going to be a ton more of this kind of stuff in all the different adobe applications i'm thinking like when this hits after effects or premiere whoa this is going to be a game changer i mean it's already a game changer i mean if you're a, a photographer who does like a lot of photo manipulation like this is photoshopping like at its core, like you're adding in ships and it's blurry and there's just a whale here. Like this is crazy. Yeah, so, it kind of takes Photoshop to the next level. We've got someone in the chat, Johan, I think I'm saying that correctly, who's suggesting we put a mermaid on top of the ship. Um, I don't know how open you are to that. <laughs> look, uh, this is not my final piece. So let's try it. Let's see. Let's see what happens. Uh, I, I bet it's going to be like blurry and stuff, but let's see. The last mermaid. couple of mermaids were a little bit strange looking. So we'll see what we come up with here. Yeah, man. Wade in the chat said he kind of liked the first mermaid. So like, maybe we'll get something <laughs> like that, Wade. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. But yeah, you're so right. Like, really... this, this takes Photoshop to the next level of like an iterative, like conceptualizing process of just like building and building using Photoshop's strongest tools. It's like pretty mind blowing. Okay, it's not coming up with much. This like weird stuff happening, like stuff's floating. 
I don't know what's happening there. Well, um, the ship looks good. But I think what's also really cool is that you can select like an area and just hit generative fill and generate and it kind of like does stuff. And so like how I see this, a lot of people ask me about AI. NFTs and AI, that's all my family can kind of like talk to me about. Mm -hmm. um, and artists and designers, a lot of people are like super scared about this kind of stuff. I see AI as like somebody sitting next to me, like a robot sitting next to me and be like, hey robot, can you just, can you just do something here? Like, did you just see what it just did? Like, yeah. Wow. Hold on. It's like, okay, let's go for this one. I don't quite know how that whale is there, but it looks real. It's, it just it's... gives you like tons of options and not like sketches. It's like, okay, here's some options. Like, okay, what's next? Well, yeah, and you're right too, in terms of like the way that you think about AI as a tool, right? It's almost like you've got this intern or you've got this research assistant, or you've got this person who's doing stock photography searching for you, but it's doing it in real time alongside you. Looking at it as a collaborator is a really cool, I think like productive way of thinking about it. Wow, there's a shock. I mean, Ooh. even in the, the coding world, like I think GitHub has a, a code assist or a code complete bot. And so you're like coding and the, the code assist, I think it's called Copilot. And I really like that name. It just suggests a bunch of code for you. And you're like, yeah, I'll take that. So it's like having somebody there writing the code with you. They're not taking control and writing your whole app or whatever. They're just doing stuff at super, you know, human speed or super computer speed. Like, yeah, this kind of stuff is just ridiculous. So yeah, maybe we would go for a shark like that. And sometimes it doesn't look quite real, but that's okay. Like I'm me, I'm not after realistic kind of stuff. So I'm just gonna nuke all of this and start again. And what I'm gonna try is a Vogue-like photo, um, a model photo. So we can do some doodle bombing on top of it. If you've mm -hmm. done any kind of AI stuff, you'll know that what you write into these prompts is super, super important and i'm still no genius at this even when describing my own work i'm like ah doodly kind of colorful stuff with birds and suns and it's it doesn't ever give me anything like that so it's a skill you gotta know how to write a prompt so i'm just gonna write something like vogue model black and white and this kind of uh, experimentation that i'm doing is part of a series that I'm calling like man and machine. Mm -hmm. Like how can I work with technology and create something with me to, you know, create something really cool. So it's given me some options. I prefer female models. Um, so I'm gonna try that again and I'm gonna go for portrait. So let's just put that there. Yeah, so kind of what you for... were saying, we've got someone in the chat saying, Penny Doodle says, I'm thinking of AI as a tool that still needs an operator. And that's like what you were saying about, you kind of have to play around with it, get to know it. You're still the driving force and you're just kind of guiding it in the right direction. So that's sort of what we're watching here. Yeah, uh, exactly. Jack Watson in the chat. Hey, Jack, we just did a live stream two weeks ago. Good to see you here. And so for those of you who might just be joining us, um, uh, my name is Corey. I'm joined here by Rich Armstrong. Rich is an artist and illustrator. Um, his Behance is linked in the chat. So make sure you go check it out there. Just give his name a search on Behance to see some of his work and portfolio. Um, but right now we're using generative AI in Photoshop beta to kind of suss out a concept and start building on a piece that he is going to work on today in this live stream. All right. So this I think is looking a lot better than my previous options. So sometimes you might be like, whoa, what's happening with your lips there, lady? That's okay. This one looks really good. This one also looks pretty good. I don't quite know what's happening with the hand here. So I'm gonna use this one. It looks really, really cool. And I'm gonna work with a little bit of flowers. Um, try work with some flowers here. So I got the lasso tool and I don't want that lasso tool. This lasso tool I had the marquee tool. So I've just installed a new version of Photoshop. It keeps on telling me these tools. And I'm like, I already know how to use these tools. <laughs> okay, so 
What's cool about this is that it recognizes what's already on your canvas, already in the document. So let's go for crown of roses, not or, of oh, roses. I'm excited to see what this does. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, in your experience, do you find it, it probably makes sense to do what you're doing of just highlighting the top. If you were to highlight the whole thing and did crown of roses, it, it might give you a totally different thing than what you're looking yeah. for sometimes it then like removes the whole head or gives you a new head yeah. or face and you're like oh but i quite like that one so that's where the like you're the guide the, the, you're the operator for the ai that's where it comes in as sort of a, a learning process of figuring out like how best to use the technology yeah that looks pretty great i mean that looks really good right yeah my, my mind's kind of blown okay so let's carry on here um parts of this are looking a bit bland now you're like okay there's just a lot of skin right here so what happens if it's one of my favorite sayings designers would be like what if but i'm like what happens if and my wife always gets a little bit irritated she's like you always say that i'm like yeah, yeah you know what happens if you know mm -hmm. let's see so what about a dress or a dress of flowers flower dress flower dress let's give it a go I guess this is kind of weird because I'm getting better at English while I'm designing and, and illustrating. And yeah, for me, this is far more iterative and designery and illustratory creative than just writing prompts because you're going, just fix this image, fix this image. And what I found is that we're really good at editing stuff. Like as a designer, Corey, I, I think you probably do this. You send your client something. And it's not the finished thing. You know that it's rough and you just find out what they like, what they don't like. You know, do they want this bigger? Do they want this changed? What are you going to get back from the client? And this for me is the same kind of process. You're like, okay, I've done this. Now I just want to tweak this. I want to tweak this. Oh, now I have this idea. I want to tweak this. Whereas when you're writing that first prompt, you don't quite know exactly what you want. So I really like this process. So this, this feels really good to me. This feels more dress-like, which is great, but this feels really creative. So I'm gonna go for this one. Um, and now I'm gonna start working a little bit of mark making, a little bit of doodling, doodle bombing into this image. Um, and I've got some brushes here. One of my favorite brush companies is True Grit Texture Supply. It's quite a mouthful. And I still haven't explored all of the stuff that they offer. I downloaded their mega pack and I'm like, yes, this looks good. But after three brushes, I'm like, cool, these are my three brushes. <laughs> I'm done. That's good. So I'm going to, you know, keep on experimenting with a couple of these brushes uh, during the process. And I'm going to use the color palette that I, I always use. And I'm going to try find it in my library. There we go. You can pop yourself up over here. Uh -huh. I want to make this bigger. Or I'll just bring it out here. That's fine too. How about that? All right, so this is quite like a big color palette for me. Most people are like, Rich, you use all the colors in the world. But for me, it's just, it's really colorful. They're normally bright colors and I change them from time to time. And I'm beach balling and I haven't saved, which is not a good prospect. Um, so I've never been in a situation before where I'm live and I'm beach balling in Photoshop. So we can talk about exploration and experimentation. So I'm ADHD. Maybe you picked that up. Oh, there we go. We're back. Um, I'm going to go for this, this pink color, peach color, salmon color. I don't know what color it is. And I've created a, a new layer just so that I can remove it, hide it, show it. Um, and I'm just going to do some doodle bombing. And I'm pretty sure no matter who you are, you've done this at some point in your life. At the doctor's waiting room, uh, while you're sitting at the table waiting for breakfast or dinner, there's newspaper, a magazine, you've scratched the eyes out, you just started doodling on stuff. This is, if it's not like your like main style, this is super therapeutic. It's cathartic. It helps you think. It helps you, you know, your brain go into that subconscious mode. If you don't knit, this is what you could do as a creative, as an illustrator. 
So I'm just gonna, you know, start. And that is not the color that I want. I want this color. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was gonna talk about experimentation and exploration. I, I'm ADHD, so I'm always onto something new, something different, shiny object syndrome. I'm busy with like generative art. I'm learning how to code smart contracts. Uh, in the NFT world, I've got a couple of different series coming out and applying to grants. I have all of these things that I want to do. Learning 3D is still up there somewhere, you know? And like, how do I fit all of this into what I'm doing with clients and projects and classes and writing books and stuff is that I have these kind of projects that I have like a man and machine. And I'm like, what do I want to do? I set myself an objective. Maybe I create 10, 20, 30 pieces and I just start creating around that specific topic with a, a particular set of parameters. So my parameters here, are Photoshop, AI, and doodling, something of my style in there. And then I just kind of go and I see where that takes me. And piece after piece, I then change what I'm doing based on what I've already done. And I'm like, oh, I have a question here. What if this happens? What if I try this? And when you show it to people, they also have questions. Like a question here would be like, what happens if you then do some kind of cool AI stuff over here? Like what happens? So let's try it. Generate full, generate. Now it's gonna generate something based on what we've already got. There's flowers, there's a model, a Vogue model, black and white. Hmm, interesting. The generated images were removed because it violated something. I'm gonna try that again. I've never had that issue before. Let's generate that. And so, yeah, this is how I explore. This is how I, you know, learn new things. Okay, well, we'll give that a shot a bit later. I'm just gonna deselect and carry on doodling for now. Um, and going back to the, the being a kid thing, I think at times in life, we have these things that we absolutely enjoy. And for me, it was doodling. It's always been doodling. And even at, uh, well, I was gonna say art school, I went to a multimedia school. It's called Vega. Um, even there, it was like, well, yeah, you, you can doodle, but like that doesn't lead to anything. Like you can't be a professional doodler. Like you can be an artist who's like very conceptual, but doodling, yeah, you can be an illustrator and, you know, work for clients. And I was like, yeah, but uh, like I want to be, I just want to doodle, you know? I want to create my own stuff, my own brand. And so as like a 13-year-old kid, I was designing T-shirts and, badges and you know all kinds of stuff like that i didn't know what photoshop was at the time but yeah i knew that's what i wanted to do and so it's taken me yeah a good number of years like 15 years to finally start doodling that and kind of weird to be an adult who then doodles like a kid or creates like a kid um but for some people it's being a doctor like my kid at the moment loves being a doctor but she also loves drawing and i don't know like which one when she's 20 or 30 she's going to be like yes this i've seen it all along could you not have seen that i was going to be a doctor I, I don't know but for some people it's making movies like they've run around as a kid with their parents iphone or their parents like handicam or whatever um and then you go back and you do that stuff as an adult and maybe you add a little bit of reason and purpose why you're doing that. You're taking videos or making videos of weddings or you're making movies or you're into 3D and you're telling stories because it wasn't necessarily the movie that got you. It was the story. Or maybe you were totally into plays and putting on plays for your family at Christmas holidays, stuff like that. And I always found it fascinating what people, especially creative people, did as a kid like what made them come alive and what does that look like a little bit transformed and you know mixed in with adult life um 
So for me, like I've always doodled in black and white. Very seldom have I ever colored anything in. But last year I started coloring things in and I happened upon this gradient style and this texture style um, because previously I'd done some texture kind of stuff for a hundred day project of mine and the gradient thing, I was six years old when I won a coloring in competition and I had these wax crayons and I blended them like a gradient from like one color into another color. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Like I've always doodled, but this particular style of having these gradients between two different you know, colors that came from when I was six years old, like that's just, it's mental, you know, and all of these stories that I weave into my work, like I could tell stories for days. Like I tell my, my kid a story every night. Um, sometimes I tell my wife a, a bedtime story if she couldn't sleep. So it's just crazy to see how much of our prior lives, especially, you know, when we were kids comes into the thing that makes us, you know, feel alive. All right. I've done quite a bit of, you know, doodle bombing now. I'm going to switch colors, um, go for white over here. Maybe I'll switch brushes as well to vary things up a little bit. Um, I don't know what a brush pen this one is. It's a thrashed brush pen. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Well, I can. Yeah? Yeah. Sorry about that. My internet is having some problems right now. Oh, sorry. Hopefully huh? everyone was cool with me just monologuing. I wasn't like getting anything from you. So I was like, I don't know what's happening out there. I hopefully I'm not just My talking apologies. To well, you are great at keeping the crowd going. So thank you for doing that in my absence. <laughs> what did I miss? Where are we? <laughs> well, this is what we missed. Did you see any of the, the errors that were popping up? Um, the place that I lost you was kind of right after the rose crown. Oh, damn. That was a while ago. Yeah. But I love what I'm seeing right now. Okay. Okay. So we've got like one eye and part of the face done. Um, I want to try add, you know, perhaps some little wisps or something coming from these roses here. Um, and then see if AI can help us out a little bit, see what it suggests. The last time we tried AI, it was like, I think it told me I was doing something wrong or illegal or something. I don't know. I've never seen that before. So huh. I'm going to carry on working my magic, my magic, and then I'm going to see what AI's magic uh, can suggest. So I'm curious, Rich, um, in terms of your process, for a piece like this, do you kind of just go in and you iterate based on like an existing idea that you have, or you sort of go in and blind? Do you have like sketches? I know this is kind of part of, of a series for you. So, so can you kind of like talk us through um, where you're coming from with a piece like this? Uh, so I can show you a couple of pieces that I've done prior to this, but doodle bombing for me is always about people. I find it quite hard to doodle bomb like a landscape. Although I have seen that done really well with like monsters climbing over buildings and through the sea and in clouds. So that could be something that I could explore. Um, but yeah, prior to this, all I knew is that I wanted a Vogue model and I was going to doodle bomb it. And then it's a very intuitive kind of approach. Um, I quite like uh, crescents, moons in eyes. I use quite a lot of that in my doodle verse style. And just mark making, I find it very intuitive just to make all kinds of different marks and see how things go in a composition. So very loose. Um, I just feel like it's a therapeutic exercise almost. And yeah, because, I mean, oh, go for it. I was going to say, because it's an experimentation, like it's not a client project, I'm not necessarily going to sell this uh, as an NFT. I might. I don't feel pressured into making it like super perfect. So if, if at this stage I was like, nah, that's not working for me, I'd you know, quite happily start again. Um, sometimes I even set a timer to be like half an hour or an hour, I'm just going to play around and whatever happens, happens. So there's no expectations. There's nothing uh, you know, on the other side that I'm really wanting to get to in this piece anyway. Um, yeah, that, that kind of taps into what you said at the beginning too of wanting to tap into that childlike energy of just sort of sketching, right? Um, so for people who are joining us or who have joined us recently or since my little offline moment, um, you know, I think something that people in the chat and something that I really resonated with um, that Rich was talking about in the beginning was 
like a lot of his work, he finds tapping into that childlike energy to be, uh, I mean, that's kind of a goal of yours, right? As you said within the last like year or so, which I think is like really cool. Yeah. And I think that I personally have benefited from, I'd be curious to know if in the chat, if anyone else kind of tries to capture some of this childlike energy or curiosity with their work, and if they find it helpful for them as they're like, you know, working on a design project or an art project, um, we'd love to hear from you in the chat. Yeah, I, yeah. Please let me know, like this kind of voice, this kind of reason why I create, I didn't initially like identify with it. And only through creating for, I did a hundred day project where I created an NFT every single day. I minted it. There was that pressure to create something every day. And I did it like, and I kept on creating, but about halfway through, like things really started to gain momentum and there was this one guy, we we're on a space together. We we're all about to reach a thousand Twitter followers, which for some people might be like, that, that's nothing. I've got like a hundred thousand followers. Um, but yeah, it was like a hundred thousand, I mean, a hundred thousand. It was a thousand followers in this very like niche space uh, on this blockchain called Avalanche. And we we're all like artists, uh, content creators, developers. And we we're like having a race to get to a thousand followers. We we're all about 950 and there were giveaways involved. And the guy was like, you know what, Rich, like, I like your stuff, but it, it's not like the best. And I was like, okay, okay, I'll let you carry on talking, you know, mm -hmm. he's, he's like, it's, it's not the best. But when I see it, it, it reminds me of being a kid. It reminds me of like reading Lord of the Rings and, you know, about orcs and knights and fairy tales and the dreams I had. And I was like, yes, that's it. Like, that's what I've been trying to to like process. Like when I was a kid, everything was possible. I had all of these dreams. I had, you know, I wanted to be a, a pilot and I wanted to go to the moon and I wanted to, you know, have a, a t-shirt brand and, you know, wanted to be a surf photographer or a rock star or whatever the thing may have been. But mm -hmm. as we get into being an adult, it's like, oh no, I'm quite okay with my job, nine to five, got my house, got to pay my mortgage, got to take my kids to school. <laughs> it just kind of fizzles out, you know? Yep. So yeah, definitely wanted to tap into that. Yeah, I mean, there's something to sort of like the freedom of childhood that allows you to dive deep into your imagination. Like you said, as adults, we kind of get bogged down by the practicality of life or by the responsibilities of life. And so I, I mean, what I'm hearing you say and what I'm feeling is that like, when you can tap into that sense of play and that curiosity is like such a valuable thing because there is so much creativity hidden in that space. Um, Let's see. I see clever in the chat who says, I find it is better to go with the flow, even if it's not what I was trying for. And I think that, that kind of like encapsulates my idea of play as a designer or as an artist is like kind of going with the flow and just seeing what comes from it. And that's sort of what you're doing here today, right? Yeah, definitely. And this kind of informs like what you then do for a client or for you know a paid project or something that's far more intentional. It's like, oh, I kind of like really like this area here. Hmm. Let's carry that on in another project or another piece. It's like you iterate on that or not the biggest fan of this or what can I change here or what can I change there? Like I'm going to you know go for a different color now and just do a little bit of drawing on top of these white things. Um, but definitely it's like that you know, just playful. It's inquisitiveness. There's no real yeah. outcome that you're hoping for. And I do this intuitively and I struggle to like kind of put words to it. But when I see my kid doing this, like she would build a tower of blocks and then bash it down and then build a tower again and bash it down. I'm like, as a, as an adult, I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're bashing the tower down. Can't you just build it and, you know, keep it up there. But like, I realized like she doesn't really care about the outcome. She cares about the act of building. I mean, it's that's like, what they oh, say, right? It's all about the journey. Exactly. And there's it's something like, beautiful in that like iterative process, right? Like maybe she does it a little bit differently each time or learns something new each time. Yeah. It's like she's getting, becoming an expert at building blocks. Like she doesn't care about the box, the blocks being built. She just cares about building. Yeah. yeah. And it's the same when she draws now, like just scrunches up paper and she tears paper out. And I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. I want to frame it. And she's like, Pow! chuck it over there. Another, <laughs> give me another one. Here's glue. Oh, it's purple glue. Let's just go all over the show. And I'm like, 
mm, that's glue. Like you need to stick something with glue. <laughs> and I'm like, but hold on. Like, is she like figuring out that glue might actually really like way better than wax crayon that she has? Because it must be super smooth with glue, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, wow, that is purple glue. So it actually looked like wax crayon. It's like, well, I should try that, you know? Yeah. So yeah, just watching her and other kids just create and explore it's fascinating it makes me yeah. you know want to encourage that and you know, try it out a lot more totally i mean that's what a great example you have to like see a kid's exploration who doesn't understand the rules or maybe doesn't care about the rules of even like what glue is meant to be and so in that experimentation or you know that like not knowing you get to learn and like see new processes for things and get new ideas. And it kind of like, I mean, it's a good reminder for us as creatives to sort of like say, break the rules every once in a while or be less precious about the outcome and just kind of like go with the flow and see what feels good. And you're going to come up by not have otherwise. Yeah, exactly. Like this process now, I'm like looking at this eyebrow, I'm like, yeah, could be a little bit better. But at the same time, it's like, well, let's see what happens with it. And I'm pretty curious to know what the AI will do at some stage. So I'm going to finish this eyebrow and then see kind of what it will give us. Yeah. So something I'm curious about. So we're talking about playing, right? And just sort of like experimenting and iterating through like a process of curiosity. But um, you talked a little bit in the beginning about doing some collaborations. You showed us some collab projects in your Behance profile. Um, what do you find it's like to like bring that sense of play to a partnership with another with another creative? Like, what does that look like for you? Oh wow! It, yeah, it. Oh wow, that's that's interesting. Huh. So that that's like that's pretty cool. Like, look how it's done the same kind of thing with that eye, and kind of feels a little bit like Asian there. Mm. I don't know which one I enjoy the most. So that's like a really interesting detail like around here. So what's pretty cool about this is that I'm just gonna cut this part or maybe a little bit of this part too. And I'm going to just duplicate that and turn this one off. So something like that begins to look a little bit collagey. So mm -hmm. maybe I will just going to decrease the saturation a little bit. Cool. And what's cool about this is that when you do the generative AI, it creates a new layer and it looks like it even creates a new layer mask um, that yeah. you can like edit around. So it's not like fundamentally changing everything you've done before. It's just adding something new and editable on top of it. That's really cool. Yeah. So I don't usually use the smudge tool. I think this is the smudge tool. Let's see what happens. Yeah. This is pretty, uh, you know, where Adobe Fresco might come in just to help with these kind of things. Got some really cool water brush uh, tools. Oh, but I must save this actually. So let me save this quickly. Don't forget to save your um, files, everybody. It's important. Yeah, exactly. Creative Cloud files. Like I'm. Things always change. Creative Cloud files. Do I save it here? Normally, there's a. Oh, there we go. Save to cloud documents. There we go. I'm just gonna go for model save. Um. And this eye is looking really interesting. I'm going to create a new layer and work off of that. And I'll change this to multiply. And then I can put a bit of color into these like beads or this, I don't know what it made a bee. Um, but yeah, so. Mm, there's nothing happening. Oh, because I'm smudging. Yeah, I don't want to smudge. Um, so when I create with other people, like at times it's really difficult. It's like, yeah, you didn't do what I wanted. And mm -hmm. I think when that happens, it's perhaps your your interests and your styles and what you do are too similar. It's like somebody said to me, why are you collaborating with this person? Or why are you collaborating with me? Mm -hmm. So I often look for people who have totally different styles. So like I often want to collaborate with a photographer 
or a graphic designer who's working with grids or who's working with vector um, so that I can bring this playful style, this playful kind of uh, intuitive doodling to mm -hmm. the piece. Um, I love working with something that's already there. So if they have a style uh, and they bring the first like iteration, I'll be like, yes, now I can work with this. I will put in a bunch of elements and I'll pick out some of the things that are existing or already there in their piece. And I'll play around with that and sometimes send it back. Um, perhaps I can show this one over here. Like this process, what started first was the grid. So I took a grid that they had already designed and I put in photos and then I kind of filled in each of the little squares or segments. Sometimes mm -hmm. I went out the lines, I experimented a little bit more. So if that grid wasn't there, I don't know if I could necessarily do that intuitive drawing and make it look like that because I'm using what they've given me as a reference, as a starting point. Yeah, um, totally. Well, and that's that kind of goes in tandem with you know, talking about being experimental and playing with things. You you might not have created that if not for this like fully different creator who you came in and collaborated with and like forced you to think outside of the box a little bit. So, you know, like collaborating with people who are too similar to you, it might not give you that much of room for experimentation or what have you. But collaborating with someone who thinks completely different with than you is like a great sort of opportunity to try new things. Yeah. I mean, I would love, I don't know if you have ideas of who you'd like to collaborate with, but one, I would love to collaborate with fashion designers to be like, look, I want this, this kind of doodling, this kind of doodling and any kind of my, like my doodling to be on clothing. Like, mm -hmm. yes, let's make that happen. And 3D, like I haven't learned 3D yet. I made a donut. I think everyone's made a donut, you know, the yep. spinning donut. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I haven't really got beyond that. So I would love to work with someone who's just like, yes, I can do 3D stuff like in my sleep and to be like, okay, let's bring this doodle verse, these doodles, this abstract play into that realm. Like, what does it look like to do this in like a 3D space or with VR goggles on it in a 3D environment? Oh, that would be pretty wild to see your artwork, like, and be able to interact with it in some kind of like AR or VR situation. That would be really cool. Yeah. But, well, and you showed us in the beginning a mural that you had worked on on your B hands. Have you done have you done a lot of murals or is that your first one? I've done two. Oh, yeah. So one and a half, really. Um, I've done one in Barcelona for this company called Ava Labs, who run the Avalanche blockchain uh, at their conference. It's quite cool. I did an illegal one. I, I got told where to paint. I just painted on a wall instead of a canvas. Um, so that was pretty cool. I did that. And then I was like, this, this is life changing just to be hot and sweaty and painting in the sun is great rather than just on a, you know, a piece of glass, which is kind of what I'm doing now and on an iPad. Um, but then I did a sticker design. I was like, Hey, here's my portfolio. I want to, you know, paint your windows gallery. And they were like, great. Can you come in in two days time? Uh, we've got an exhibition coming up. So I was like, yeah, cool. And then they wanted stuff to be far more opaque than I think it would have turned out. So I ended up designing a sticker that went on their window. And I'm like, yes. And people were like driving past or cycling past, just like looking at it. Some kids were even like, wow, that's awesome. And I'm like, yes, that's it. You know, and it was for a coral reef uh, project. Uh, so part of their gallery is the sunglass, sunglasses, sunshades you know, not the reading glasses mm -hmm. and they, part of their, you know, profits go towards cleaning up plastic from this Island in Malaysia. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. So they're all about coral reefs and the Island life and sustainability. So I got to design a coral reef, like all with vectors. I did it in Adobe Fresco, uh, exported it to Photoshop or Illustrator, no, to Illustrator and then sent it off to the printer, which normally for me, clients and printers are not good combinations, but I did it and it's on a window and we stuck it and it looks awesome. That sounds um, so cool. 
We've got someone in the chat, Thomas, um, put a design of his uh, in eight parts on a zippered hoodie and it came out really, really well. Uh, it looks like through an on-demand printing service. Um, that could be like something kind of cool. I mean, I personally know as in my practice as a graphic designer is I like taking things out of the computer. It's kind of what you're talking about, taking things out of the computer, out of this like 1D or 2D space and putting it somewhere. And I love the idea of just like, even on your own, like making it a project for yourself of putting it onto an article of clothing or just like put, bringing it out into the world. Um, I think that that's really cool. Yeah. Um, the last time I was on uh, Adobe Live, I featured a, an artist called Leonik and she's got a clothing brand called Leonik on clothing and her stuff is just phenomenal. And she did a, an H&M uh, collaboration. And oh, cool. yeah, I was like, Wow, it just looks, it looks awesome when it feels like fashion people make up like your ideas and they collaborate with you. And it's not just like in the middle or, you know, printing on top. It's like a swimming costume. Uh, it's like kids pajamas and it's all kinds of different pieces of clothing for all kinds of different people like shirts, hats, uh, yep. swimming costumes, bags, totes, all that kind of stuff. And it just looks so good as a collection, plus mm -hmm. like all the window displays. I'm like, that is cool. So I hope to get there. Um, and sometimes I guess as artists or designers, we look at other artists and we're like, wow, that's awesome. I'm super jealous. Or how do I get there? And I got to keep reminding myself, like I've only been an artist, like calling myself an artist for a year and a half. Yeah. Like this is my body of work for a year and a half. Sure, I've been doodling my whole life. Mm -hmm. I've always been creating and stuff, but actually i've just been an artist for a year and a half so it's which like, is wild wow. what you've accomplished in a year and a half is like really amazing so yeah. like you're kind of just starting out yeah exactly and it feels good i gotta remind myself like i'm an underdog sure i'm 35 years old sure i have a kid and, and a house and stuff like that and it feels very like adult like but i'm still an underdog and i remember when i, I was 21 it felt really good to be 21 just out of university and being better than other people um doing code stuff and man i was doing flash kind of stuff i don't even know if you guys remember flash um, oh yeah that that got like retired off the internet i feel like <laughs> yeah exactly i was like oh i know flash and then two years later i was like oh, yeah you should, yeah I, I know flash but nobody else cares about that so <laughs> no. and um, um, you know, what's coming to mind, actually. So um, are you do you, are you familiar with um, the design firm? I guess that's what we could call them. Um, MM Paris. No, I'm not. So they are a really cool. They're a design firm based in Paris, France. Um, it's I think that the way that they spell it out is just M slash M Paris. Um, they I would absolutely check them out if I were you because they do a lot of sort of like sketching types of design work. They do a lot of really cool logo work, a lot of really cool typography work, but it's all kind of based in sketching and like iterative sketching processes. They have gone on record saying that they use Photoshop and their Photoshop files are ginormous with hundreds of layers in them. But what I think what and why I'm thinking about them for you is that they do a ton of work with a lot of big fashion houses in Paris. Um, so they've worked with like Loewe, they've worked with J.W. Anderson, and a lot of their like sort of sketched out work ends up in purses and ends up in t-shirts and ends up in like formal wear, ends up in dresses. So I think you should check them out. I think you'd really like them. Please send me a link or something somehow. Or maybe I yeah. can just do it now. I'll do it now. Yeah, if you want to pull yeah. it up, uh, it's just what MM Paris. For? You Google that, Bali. that should come up. And then, yeah, they've got, maybe go to their website and you'll see their their website is quite conceptual as I'm seeing now. Maybe if you just go to like Google images, you'll find some of their kind of more popular work. Um, but they have a lot of big kind of like sketchy installations that are in like Paris Fashion Week. Um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, if you click on like, one of those yeah, a like lot of like this yeah this kind of stuff uh-huh like hand-drawn elements like layered over different photography that they'll commission um it's pretty cool stuff and there's a couple of like really beautiful art books that they've put out with like volumes and volumes of their work um but i like i could not recommend them enough i've been a huge fan for a long time 
Uh, yeah, I like that one. Oh, I like it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, totally. Check them out a little bit more. And yeah, I also know that like when you are a little bit young or immature or you know just starting out, sometimes you don't think that you can approach people like that. But I've learned that you just got to ask like, hey, yep. what are you guys doing? Are you guys doing a mural at this conference? Nope. I'm like, can I do a mural? Yep. <laughs> what do you need? I'm like, I need Posca markers because that's the only thing I can draw with. I've never done a mural before. Um, okay, cool. We'll give you Posca markers. Great. There we go. Hey, guy, I've done a mural and here's my portfolio. Can I do your windows? Yeah. <laughs> what do you need? I don't know, but okay, let's end up with a sticker. So that kind of stuff is like, hey, this is what I want to do. Paris cool company like what's the worst thing that can happen they just say nope yep and that's fine you know yeah I think something my parents taught me is it's always worth the question right because like sometimes people don't know what they want until you like help them get there and so like maybe they didn't know that they wanted a mural at this festival or whatever but if you suggest it then they're like oh cool do you know a muralist and you're like I'm a muralist like let's do this together and they're like sweet <laughs> I'm a muralist yeah, I mean, at what stage do you say I am an artist or I am a muralist? Like, I want to become a muralist? Like, does that make you a muralist? Like, I've done one? Like, guys, I did this. Like, does that make me a muralist? I think it does. I think it makes you a muralist. Yeah. So it's just like, well, do like the least amount of work that you need to do to become the thing that you want to be so that you can tell people that you are that thing. Like, I did this. Took me 10 minutes. I am a muralist. Therefore... I want to do another mural, you know, like you can kind of cheat your way into it, but it's not really cheating. It's just you have some kind of experience and you have confidence. And I think that matters a lot. Yeah. Um, and being a nice guy. That's being a I've nice guy a always helps. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's... Okay. Thomas in the chat says trends come and go, but fashion relentlessly goes after beauty for the sake of beauty. And I think, I mean, that's totally why I find myself gravitating towards fashion too. And I think that's why we see a lot of this, like a lot of avant-garde art and design coming out of the fashion industry, because you're right. Like they do really push. It sounds like that's kind of why you're drawn to fashion too, Rich, is because they, they kind of push the boundaries and there's like a very artistic conceptual thinking behind like clothing and wearable items and that's why we see so many cool collaborations going through like NH&M or JW Anderson or uh, brands like that. Yeah, I also think like as a digital illustrator or artist, like it's cool. My stuff's on the blockchain. It's going to be there forever. But people are like, oh, that's cool. That's a really nice piece of art. And I'm like, yeah, but it's just you're just scrolling. It's really small. Like yeah. when you word on you. It's, it does something. It's like it's part of your identity. It, mm -hmm. it transfers something to other people as you walk into a room, as you walk down the streets. Like, you know, there's that kind of stuff that it's really exciting. Um, yeah. Maybe that's why I'm drawn to real life stuff. I love, I love digital. Like it's quick, it's easy. I can do it on my couch. But yeah, the the real life stuff becomes amazing. Yeah, that I mean, you're stuff. right. We spend so much time on our devices. So when we can bring something into the tangible world, into the 3D world that we can interact with and put on our bodies, that kind of takes it to the whole next level. And it also kind of changes your approach too, right? Is it's like, I mean, I'm sure we've probably got people in the chat who can relate to this. I'm sure you can relate to this, but like you can create something on the computer and then you print it out or you put it onto a t-shirt or you put it onto a wall and you're like, whoa, that actually kind of changes this, changes the way that it looks and, you need to like think about things in a different way. Definitely. I mean, when I started doing these NFTs, like, and then people said, cool, can I print this? Can you send me the high res file? I'm like, it's, it's like this big. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I'm like, oh, I can't think about that. Like you want to print this? You want to print it really big? Ah, so some of my stuff later on was like A3 size. And it took me a long time to do compared to something that's like, just under a four size yeah so if you are print or if you're creating something that will oh that second one was kind of interesting um i don't know what's going on but it's very like i don't know looks almost like an, a cartoon or something 
feels uh, like Mickey Mouse's hand with an eye or something. It does, doesn't it? It's really like strange. Um, <laughs> I was going to say like, I'm just going to ditch this, but maybe let's go for it. And I'll show you guys something else that I do. I like to do is that, you know, this is happening. And every time I ask the AI to put something in, it's going to be like, oh, I see what's happening in your composition. Let me try add to it or work with you. Sometimes I'm like, no, just, just be the collage artist. I just need a stock photo. So I was going to press Command T to open up another one, but that wouldn't work. So let's create a new one. And here I can be like, give me birds. Give me a flock of flying pigeons. That's how you spell pigeons. So you're going to say, um, I was going to ask, you know, in terms of your process for creating something for 3d, right? I know you've got a lot of work with NFTs and creating digital work, but how does your sort of workflow change? Are you printing things out as you're going along? If you're planning out something for a mural, are you just kind of iterating on the wall itself? What is, what does your process look like for that? Um, the, the, that mural that I showed you in the beginning, uh, it's one up here. Uh, I think there's a little bit of the planning. So this is like what it looks like. Um, cool. Some of the process, like this is my first little sketch in my, my journal or sketchbook. Um, and then from there, it was just like, cool, let's, let's go for it. So there's the kind of process for this one. Nice. And luckily for this, there wasn't really much back and forth with the, the client. It was like, do what you want. The The theme is like springtime and new life. So I did like doodle verse, graffiti kind of style with that theme in mind. Um, and then the, the fish one, I'll just try to think about how I might show you that. I don't think it's going to be super easy, but that was a, a, a sketch in, in Fresco. And then took that to the client. And then a couple of changes and then did something in fresco and then took out half of it based on some feedback and that was it um and then had to make things a bit smaller so that the printer could print it in time so yeah really flexible uh working with both of these murals or you know real life pieces but i i think the early me like maybe 21 22 year old me working with clients and printers would not have been a good fit for this because I was like, this is my design. I came from like this multimedia design kind of background. I know what is going on. I know how to run a business. I came top of my class. Like I know everything. And so when a client said to me, can I have my logo bigger or can we change this? I was like, no, 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 absolutely not. Like I'm the designer. Whereas now I'm like, it doesn't matter too much. Like who cares if like the fish is over here or the fish is over there. Yeah. Um, so I leave things quite open-ended, quite flexible. And the more flexibility a client can give me, the better I feel. Like if I can just paint freely like this on somebody's window, fantastic. Or on a wall, fantastic. But if they need a little bit more planning, then again, like I see it as a challenge and, and I'm flexible. I'm like, okay, like, cool. You don't want a sun. You don't want a submarine. What do you want? Okay, you want a, a snorkeler or a diver. Let's put that in. Um, okay, so I'm going to see if I can incorporate these birds. You'll see it's quite different from what I'm working with uh, over there. So I'm just going to go copy all. I hope that works. No. Let's try again. Well, that's cool. So you selected the whole, um, I want to call it an art artboard, but I guess the whole canvas. And um, you put in the pigeon prompt and then the generative AI just kind of brought in what looks pretty much like a stock image, which is really cool. Yeah. And... What's always deterred me from doing these kind of things before is, oh, what, who, who owns the stock image? Where do I find this? I have to spend so long, you know, trying to find stock images and even with music, things like that. Whereas now I'm like, this doesn't have any rights or anything. I don't think, um, I don't need to worry about copying people, um, yeah. especially cause I'm reworking it, you know? So I'm just like boosting up the contrast here and then I'll apply some blend modes, which may look pretty cool. Um, and so I feel a lot freer to just play and, you know, maybe to mint this as an NFT or send it or license it or something like that. Not worrying that somebody somewhere down the line is going to be like, Hey, 
I'm going to sue you because you use my image. I'd be like, oh, sorry. And maybe this will happen in the future. Maybe AI generators or code bases, the people and companies behind them will get sued just because of how law and copyright infringement and that kind of stuff works. But I don't think the individuals will have to you know, bear that, that burden uh, down the line. Uh, yeah, so what so, Wade in the chat is reminding us of is that everything that is generated from Adobe Firefly, that AI, is that it all comes from Adobe stock images. So I guess it's generating these AI images from Adobe's stocks.com's existing library of, I don't know, I'm assuming thousands, millions of different images and just pulling them together into a new way. Nice. And um, so, Wade's also reminding Adobe Firefly is for non-commercial use only while in beta. So it, it is a service and product right now that is um, in beta. So I think that the images that are generated from it come with a little watermark or that you're not, that we, you don't necessarily own the rights to and that you can't like bring out to a client and like automatically own, um, be free from any copyright laws. So I'm sure there's there's some like details and fine print there. Okay. So yeah, like in this case, it was Wade, right? Like, yes. would this be like con considered like fair use? Like, could I take this into a commercial kind of application or mint this as an NFT simply because I've not just taken the image and said, cool, let's go with it. The AI did this, but I've worked with the AI and created something that, you know, I don't think many people would say, oh yeah, this is definitely an AI piece. I think a lot of people might assume that there's stock images. Maybe I took my own photos and it definitely feels like a tap, tap, kaboom, Rich Armstrong, you know, kind of a piece. Yeah, I mean, I think my understanding of copyright in general is that because you've taken bits and pieces of it and created something entirely new and different and individual from what was existing before, the copyright law doesn't pertain. I don't, I don't know the details of it. Don't hold me to that. But I do think that like, this is like, these pigeons that you pulled in are now like part of your overall image that you own just based on like copyright infringement law. Like you don't even have to copyright something for you to own it. It's it's yours as soon as you've created it. Um, so I, I think that's like about how it works. That's my understanding. Cool. Always, yeah. It would be great if there was a lawyer in here as well. Maybe there is, I don't know. <laughs> if there's a lawyer um, in the chat, please say hi. <laughs> yeah. I would love, I think there was, there was one guy, I can't remember his name, Mike, Mike somebody. He's a graphic designer, quite big beard, and he has a lawyer friend and they do talks together. Um, okay, so now I'm really happy with this, but I still feel there's elements missing. So what I'd like to do is open it up in Adobe Fresco. So I'm gonna jump to my iPad. Dirt, 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 and let's see if it's actually there. I might just move my, my Wacom bring my iPad in here and change pens and pencils and all kinds of stuff and screen so while we do a quick little transition I just like to tell anyone who's listening either if you're joining us from the YouTube live stream if you're joining us from the Behance live stream make sure you hit um, subscribe on the YouTube channel you can also follow Adobe live on Instagram to see updates of when these live streams happen we've got many live streams happening with many different creatives all over the world every single day of the week. Um, also, if you yourself are interested in streaming, doing an Adobe Live live stream, or if you'd like to nominate a friend or a fellow designer, um, you can do that um, in a tab on the Behance channel. So if you go to behance.net slash live, um, if you're watching over on YouTube, you can head over to that link and nominate yourself or a fellow designer for uh, a live stream opportunity. So we'd love to have you. And now it looks and yeah, like we've guys, moved over to Fresco. Is that right? Wait, or is that right, Rich? Yeah, we're in Adobe Fresco on the iPad. So again, if you're like, whoa, what happened? How did you just get it onto Fresco? Like Photoshop and Fresco play really well together. Um, one of the big things I love about this is that you can move between Fresco and Photoshop really easily. I love using Photoshop for some stuff, love using Fresco for other things. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is merge everything. Uh, merge. And this is also a really nice thing when you're playing, like a kid doesn't care. So just merge stuff. You don't have to keep everything as layers. And we can save this as something else in the future. 
or it's just, you know, part of the play, part of the exploration. But one of the big things I like about this is these brushes here, these oil brushes, and they take on some of the properties from the paint beneath them. So I'm going to go for a flat or oil round. And again, let's go for Beetleverse colors. So thank you, Wade, for dropping into the chat that nomination form. So if anyone's interested in nominating themselves or fellow designer or artist for Adobe Live, um, just go ahead and fill out the Airtable form that Wade dropped into the chat. Um, it's in the YouTube live stream and the Behance live stream. So just fill that out and we'd love to we'd love to have new people on these live streams. And yeah, guys, if you're like, oh, I can't be on a live stream. I don't know enough. Like, seriously, just do it. Just like, do it. <laughs> just do it. Yep. Like, sometimes you'll be super nervous. Sometimes you'll be sweating because you're super anxious. But next time, it won't be so bad. And some people will learn from you. Some people will be inspired by you. And you can then say, hey, I was on uh, Adobe Live. So, uh, guys, check this out. This is a live brush, oil paint. And it's got this paint mix. So as I paint, it picks up from the paint beneath it, which is super cool. Mm -hmm. So I just did a couple of like test brushes and things like that. And it feels like oil paint as well, or it looks like oil paint as well. So you get this like mixed media kind of effect when you start working with this. And you yeah, can see like cool. the paint changes color. As if yeah. you're painting with real paint. It like right. comes on really thick and full of color at the front stroke. And then, oh, that's really cool. So you went over the black there. So it even pulled some of the black from the bird in with the paint. So it's truly like you're painting on like a wet piece of canvas. Yeah. Like, and you may see some of these shapes uh, in my other pieces. And I guess there are some things that I, I can't shift out of. I have to like really mentally say, I'm not going to use these circular shapes or whatever. Um, but sometimes it's just this free form kind of play. And it's like, well, I'm using the shapes that I'm comfortable with. But the, the process that we've been to get here, we've done AI stuff. I've used some new brushes. I don't usually work a lot in Photoshop. Like I've had this Wacom tablet. This is some massive Cintiq. It's not the big one, but it's a pretty big one. I've had it for two years, but I use my iPad way more just because it's got so many more apps and I can sit on the couch and take it home. So it's been like a, a process of learning how to use it, learning how to use Photoshop, but then bringing it into it, Fresco really easily. Man, it's it's powerful. Well, especially so, when some of those like concepts of layers and this, the tools kind of cross over, that's when you can really like feel the whole ecosystem come together. And that's when you as a creative, like you get to know those tools really well. And then the possibilities are endless. Yeah. It's, it's honestly, sometimes I sit down, I live stream on YouTube. Uh, I try to do it every Tuesday, but I haven't been super consistent, but sometimes I sit down. I'm like, what we're doing right now is we're streaming. Like, I don't actually know how this is working and there's hundreds or thousands of people watching. And I'm drawing on glass and it's being transmitted like throughout the world. The fact that I'm drawing on glass and then I'm able to like send it to my computer, which is also like glass and silicon and I don't know what else is in there. And then like, it's, it's crazy and how this is mimicking paint. And then I mint it on a blockchain and guys, this is a crazy world that we live in. And now we're introducing AI into our workflow. I don't know why people get super upset about the technology and how this is going to change everything. It's like, are we not like changing everything enough already? Like Photoshop, Fresco, iPad, this little pencil. Like I'm wearing this glove that makes it easier for me to move around on my iPad. Like all of this, like imagine being Picasso or Dali back in the day. This would be mind blowing. This would be magic. This would be crazy. Like everything that we do now is just, it's ridiculous. If you it think is, about it. It is ridiculous. The access to tools and systems, and community that we have, right? We've got this like worldwide access to so much and you're totally right. I mean, like Salvador Dali, I don't even know if he could conceptualize having access to all of this that we have. Yeah. It's uh, we've got Christopher in the chat. Very cool image, really like all the details. So if you guys are just joining us, um, I am here with Rich Armstrong, who is a super talented artist and illustrator. 
um, based in the Netherlands. And um, we are using generative AI from Photoshop beta, um, which is sort of how he pulled together this image. And now we're working in um, Adobe Fresco to kind of sketch on top of this um, image. It's sort of a composite of a bunch of different AI generated elements. The rose crown was generated using um, the beta AI. The birds were generated. We've got this little, um, I don't know, those little like dots on the model's forehead. Even the model itself, herself, were all from this generative AI tool that's in Photoshop beta. So it's really pretty mind blowing stuff. And now what I'm doing is I'm using a water brush tool. And this also like, it, it's live painting, but it makes everything feel quite watery. And I'm just working all on the same layer just because it's super powerful to work on the same layer in Fresco. You just see this kind of like in real time. Wow. Yeah, it's like you're pouring water onto a painting. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. And then I have a bunch of like favorite brushes that I can just quickly switch to if I wanted to. Um, maybe we go for this one. Maybe a little bit smaller. So thank you, Wade, for dropping in Rich's um, Behance profile in there. Um, Rich, do you have an Instagram that you want people to go check out too? Uh, it's probably Top Top Kaboom on Instagram. Is that right? That that's it. Um, I I don't know about Instagram at the moment. I'm on Twitter way more than Instagram. Um, I find it quite disheartening when you have like 6,000 followers or 4,000 followers and only 100 people see your post. It's like, what's oh. the point of having this flipping follower thing? Why are people here following me, but they never see my stuff? So I think there might be a, a trend towards going self-publishing in the world at the moment among creators, your own website, your own newsletter, trying out new social platforms. Like I just joined this thing called Blue Sky. Um, oh an invite only thing it's very much like twitter but twitter is also broken um so yeah you can find me on instagram you can join my newsletter uh just go to tap tap kaboom .com. find me on twitter um yeah it's a it's a kind of like a weird weird place that i'm in right now yep trying I to totally figure get out that. where do i spend my time like am i a content creator like do i want to spend i don't know like seven hours a day creating stuff for instagram that gets lost in a second yeah, I don't know. Like, I always prefer doing this kind of stuff. So you can follow me on Instagram. Just turn the little bell icon on if you definitely want to see my posts or follow me on Twitter. Um, I post far more frequently there. Um, go for a little grungy ink here. Yeah, we've got Rich's Twitter linked in the Behance live chat. Hopefully we might be able to get that in the YouTube. Yep. There goes on the YouTube live chats. Thank you, Wade, for that. And I completely hear you. I mean, the I think I think a lot of artists, a lot of designers these days are feeling a little bit disheartened with like the very many different ecosystems that we can participate in. And where do we put our time? And if we put our time in, is it worth it? I feel it's like more valuable to, like you said, kind of control your own ecosystem or to create it yourself, whether it's through a newsletter, whether it's on your website. Um, but it, you know, it's, there are so many places to put our stuff out there. And when we're working against algorithms, we're working against some bots, we're working against policies that are always changing. Um, I, I completely relate to what you're saying of like, what is Instagram and should I even be putting my time there? So it's, it's, it's definitely kind of a conundrum, I think, for a lot of modern creatives these days. Yeah. And again, it's like a lot of people are like, well, if not Instagram, like, how do I get my stuff out there? Like, how do, how do I, like, all right, yeah, you got to think, you got to be creative. Like, don't just be creative with your images, your photography, your web skills. Be creative with how you market, how you get your brand out there, how you get your services out there. Yep. Um, sometimes there's Discord communities, Reddit communities, Facebook groups even. Um, sometimes if you're like, okay, I, I want to help people who are you know getting married do their wedding invites like you don't spend the time on instagram you just go to wedding festivals or whatever they're called um there are other ways to do things like that those are probably poor examples um what i like doing is just walking around amsterdam and be like that's a cool place let me go chat to somebody cool 
I want to do your window or I want to, you know, create a, a shirt for you or design something for your glasses. Cool. There we go. Let's do it. So yep. I just real person kind of stuff. That's my strength. Like I'm terrible at Discord and Instagram and Twitter, like really like keeping up with people and following people. Great at one-on-one -on -one kind of stuff in person, very friendly, very likable kind of a person. You know, if I do say so myself, like I'm nice around, I'm a nice guy, nice guy to be around. Um, You're a nice guy to hang out with. <laughs> so yeah, so I, that's my strength. Like, let me go do that. If I was a brilliant copywriter, maybe I would write copy and put that on my website and send people long letters of why they should hire me. Maybe, I don't know. So there's always yeah. ways to, you know, do stuff. Well, and I think that's, that's why I'm also appreciative of this format here, right? Is like, we're having a live conversation. We're connecting with the community. Um, I'd be curious to, to your point for other creatives out there, if we've got people in the chat, if you have like creative ways outside of Instagram, outside of Twitter, well, how do you get your work out there? How do you connect with your community? Are you doing kind of what Rich is talking about of just going out, um, seeing a cool storefront that you might be interested in and asking to do a project with them in real time like that? Um, yeah, let's see. Penny in the chat says that's refreshing to know there is power to in-person interaction. Oh my gosh. I mean, I think like in-person interaction is so kind of underrated and maybe a little bit underappreciated in this world that is so hyper online these days. So I, I'm curious. I mean, what do what are people doing out there in the world um, to get creative outside of just creative on the canvas, outside of creative within Photoshop? What are you doing to get your stuff out there? Um, I'd be curious. Because I personally, I do similar things. I mean, I'm a graphic designer here in Portland, Oregon, um, and I have a full-time job. So I'm sort of like stuck into that a lot of the time. But when it comes to the creative work that I do outside of my full-time practice, I do a lot of freelance work. And so I am like meeting people. I'm meeting people at bars. I'm meeting people at restaurants. I'm meeting people at events. And then from there, meeting these potential clients and then working with small businesses in the area. So I'm, I'm totally doing what you're saying too, of just like the sort of word of mouth, cool introductions, vibing with the right kind of people. And then like creating collaborative projects outside of that. Yeah. And the people that you meet with, like, are they creative people or are they the people that are looking for whatever you're offering? Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the time we like hanging out with people who like us and who are like us, but they're not our clients, you know? So sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming spending time and surrounding yourself with creative people the whole time. Like, wow, this is inspirational and these guys are great, but they're not, you're not getting work. You're not getting your stuff out there. Yep. So sometimes just going to spend time with normal people is fantastic or going to places that are creative, but mixed creative, like creative mornings are really cool. It's like you get to hang out with architects. You get to hang out with people who are building brands. Mm -hmm. um, like I remember, I don't know if you guys have a, what is it called? I'm trying to think of like the right word. Feminine hygiene is the only one I can think of. Um, mm -hmm. But it's called Yoni. But this really cool Dutch brand um, of period products. Like they're amazing. They're at creative mornings. They're not creative people. They're going after like women uh period uh hygiene kind of like that market and they're mixing with creative people and you have these creative people who are like oh i want my stuff to work with you i'm a very cool minimalistic brand designer let me work with you and so you start to mix with these kind of people who are storytellers who are interesting brand people great at marketing great at storytelling and you start to mix in with those kind of people again all yeah. real life kind of stuff anyway for me that's really helpful um and then follow up with emails, follow up on social media. Yeah. So perhaps social media is like a secondary kind of a, a thing. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. I mean, I think that like, if you're an artist illustrator connecting with other artist illustrators, you know, there's obviously going to be room for creative discussion and collaboration there, but they're not necessarily the people that are going to hire you because they're providing the same services that you are. But creating with creative people, people or co co connecting with creative people who work at agencies or who have started their own companies or something like that. Um, I think that that's kind of where these true partnerships and collaborations, there's a lot of room for growth and like experimentation there because you've got someone who thinks creatively, but just in a different way. And then you can kind of like overlap in terms of your creative thinking and each providing some new different frameworks and new ideas for collaboration. They might hire you as a client. Um, that's some great advice. 
Um, we've actually got, so we've got a couple people in the chat. Joshua, happy Thursday. I'm enjoying this discussion. Thank you for joining us, Joshua. Um, and Wade is asking, Corey or Rich, if you're not in a creative environment like a bar, um, any tips on how do you bring up your work casually without dominating the conversation? Um, Rich, do you have any, do you have any like advice off the top of your head? One of the best things I've done, it depends on the, the situation, is just bring out your iPad and draw. Honestly, people are like, oh, whoa, you're an artist. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And you're like, yeah, you know? And almost like this, you just, you're creating, you get to chat to people. If they're really interested, you get to show them some of the, your behinds. I can't say that word properly. Behinds, behinds, your <laughs> behinds. South African, this accent is like kind of weird. And it's always that little thing on the E that got me. Uh -huh. um, I like what you so said. Yeah, just behinds. Behance. Um, I can say enhance, behance. Anyway. Oh, um, <laughs> but yeah, I just think that creating, doodling, whatever, like it's a really good way for me anyway to show people what I do. And if no one notices, like I still get to doodle and do what I like to do. Um, but also just asking people what they do. Like as a kid, like what did you do? Like how did you get yeah. to where you are now? Like what was your trajectory? And maybe they ask a little bit about you, but definitely being more interested in other people's journeys and their whatever they find creative or inspiring. Uh, I find that inspiring. So I always try to help other people like go back to that kid version of themselves or find out like what makes them tick and yeah. inspiring for me. And hopefully maybe they get to ask the same kind of questions and not just like, what do you do? But, you know, really start discussing uh, what your work is about, like mm -hmm. what makes it interesting. That kind of discussion is really interesting. Yeah, it's almost less about discussing your actual work and more about discussing the ideas behind it, what motivates you as a person, what kind of drives you as a creative, um, what your intention behind your work is. That I think is where like the meat of a conversation about creative work is. And that's what interests people because that's something that they could hopefully relate to um, and that they can, you know, that keeps the conversation flowing in a great way. But I love the really practical piece of advice that you said of just sitting in a bar or restaurant, like doodling on your iPad. There are definitely going to be people who come up to you and are like, oh my God, what are you doing? Are you an illustrator? Are you an artist? And then that's like a great introduction for a conversation. It's, it feels more, especially with an iPad, it feels more what's the word invite friendly like people yeah. feel way more uh okay what's the, i don't know what the word is they they they're bold they're like yeah. oh i see that you're drawing something cool can i see like what do you do are you a tattoo artist like what are you doing even other illustrators and designers like i'm always like oh like what are you doing on that ipad like i just want to see how you use the app um when someone's on a computer that's like oh you're doing serious stuff you know you're typing emails or you're in a word document or an excel spreadsheet but, you know, when you have an iPad, it's far more welcoming, far more approachable. There we go. It's approachable. approachable. Definitely. There we go. So I want to call attention to the time. We are approaching the end of this live stream. And so um, just really quick, if you've joined us halfway through this session, uh, my name's Corey. I'm a graphic designer. I'm here joined by Rich. Um, he's an artist and illustrator based in the Netherlands. Rich, do you want to just give us a quick rundown of what you've created here, the tools that you've used just to, like in a one to two minute rundown before we start getting ready to sign off this live stream? Yeah, so what I've done is we started in Adobe Photoshop beta, because if you're using beta, you can use Firefly, their inbuilt tool for creating images uh, from selections in your Photoshop documents, which is just mind blowing. It's amazing. And then I collaborated with this AI tool uh, by first creating a few images of Vogue models, black and white portraits, uh, all the words are really important. We added some flowers on her head, a crown of flowers. We added like a flower dress, which you can't really see now, but it kind of helped me set up this composition and work with the colors that I've been working with. We added something over here, which was kind of like a Mickey Mouse hand. Then I started doodle bombing, all in Photoshop. Then I brought it into Adobe Fresco on the iPad. So the original one was in, on desktop. This is on an iPad and Adobe Fresco, which just works really nicely. I've then worked with the oil brush, with watercolor brushes. I'm now working with vector brushes. It's like mixed media, but I don't have to wait for paint to dry. Just working with a very select color palette. And this is kind of where we've ended off. I'm just going to fill the last few bits of these vector shapes. 
Yeah. And so, like you know, I think using these tools, using, we, we were using, like you mentioned, um, Photoshop beta, which has the new um, generative AI in it. Um, Adobe Firefly is also in its sort of beta stages. So it's something that the public can use to generate AI images. If you're interested in learning more about AI and um, Adobe Firefly, we've got Adobe Firefly Weekly that live streams on Behance. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Um, it's an interactive session using the new Adobe Firefly. Um, but it's been, it's helped to create this amazing composition that uh, Rich has just sort of like built on top of layer after layer. Yeah, and I think that's for me, like, especially with this style, that layer after layer, it speaks quite conceptually to where we are as a creative species right now. Like everything that we do is layer on top of layer on top of layer. Like we're standing on top of the shoulders of giants who are standing on the, the shoulders of other giants, you know, it just keeps on going and going and going. Like what we're doing here with AI and Fresco and iPads and even streaming, the technology and the history and the creativity and the innovation that has like preceded this moment in history is just, it's phenomenal. And so, yeah, this kind of like layering of artwork and paints on top of AI stuff, that's what it is, like it just speaks to that. And I hope people kind of like get that when they see images like this, there's just so much there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you guys are joining us from the chat, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, I know I've had a really great time. I feel like I've learned a lot. We've had some really awesome conversations here with Rich. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Make sure you stay tuned. We're going to roll right into another live stream after this. Um, go and investigate Adobe Firefly. There's so much with potential with this generative AI. Like Rich said, we're kind of in this pivotal moment of art and design with all these resources that we have. So um, I'd just like to thank everyone for being here. I've had a lot of fun. Rich, thank you so much for walking us through your process. Ah, oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting. Guys, thank you so much for joining, for tuning in from around the world, all different time zones and you know times of day. You guys are amazing. And if you have any questions for me after this, just DM me, hit me up on email, Twitter, Instagram. I'm always available.